Dr. McMullen is retiring from LaGrange College. At the end of this year, following 25 years of service to our students, our college, and our community. And she is here to discuss international business opportunities in Portugal. Please help me welcome to the podium, Dr. Linda McMullen. Good morning. I am a teacher at heart. I love teaching. I love sharing with the students. And what I want to speak to you today is the same type of thing that I would share with students if I was trying to introduce them to global business, to business in Portugal, Portugal and to the role of culture. So I called this From Airbnb to Unbabble, International Business Viewed Through a Cultural Lens. Airbnb and Unbabble are both exemplars of the type of businesses that thrive in today's global environment. They're service industries, they require strong infrastructure and strong human networks, and the business models are adaptable to many countries. As we talk this morning, I will share information about the general business environment in Portugal, discuss foreign direct investment in recent years, offer a few examples of successful businesses that operate in Portugal and elsewhere, including the two on the screen, and I will conclude with a specific look at why understanding cultural orientation is important. Culture can be looked at from many levels. There's a national level, regional cultures, industry cultures, and specific business cultures. At LaGrange College, we have a culture here in terms of the way we do things, the way we conduct business. As a linear active culture in the West, part of that culture is we run by schedules. And so as I was preparing for this and working with Martha, she printed a sheet and she gave it to me and said, we will do this at this time and do this as we ran through it. President Baxter will come on at this time. The vice president will come on at this time. You'll start here, you'll end here. That's very much typical of Western cultures that we schedule ourselves. Sometimes it may be a little bit too much, but that's a part of who we are. We schedule ourselves. And I listened to Dr. Caffaro's lecture that begins with Prince Henry the Navigator and the journeys to find a route to India. I was really interested in that because we tend to think that globalization is new, and it's not. Portugal was a maritime powerhouse early in its history. The country's economic fortunes rose and fell due to a number of factors, environmental, economic, and political. After the global financial crisis of 2008, Portugal began making a comeback, and they were right where they needed to be in 2015. And then the pandemic hit, and they dashed their economic recovery. They're back on an upward trajectory right now, but they still are facing challenges. But they're focused on how to build their global presence. The quote at the top of the slide from Sirkin, Bacicara, and Hammerling is an expression of modern globalization. It's also that that long quote is after the colon in the book Global Globality. That's the title of the entire book. And I can't say they're wrong. But the way that we compete today is different than the way we competed when they wrote that book in 2008. Changes in business strategies are nothing new. When you look at the trajectory of business strategies over time, we can appreciate four distinct periods of history. In a domestic phrase, the importance of global customers was marginal. Technology was proprietary, and we had a product orientation. Basically, what businesses says, if you want what we have, then you buy it the way we make it, and if you don't want that, then you go someplace else. There was no interest in expanding globally. Then we entered what business professor Nancy Adler calls a multi-domestic phase. Global business became important, and that encouraged limited sharing of technology, and the orientation was toward marketing. In a third strategic period, products and services were standardized, technology started to be widely shared, and the focus was on cost savings. Then when we became truly global in the period in which that book was written, the fourth strategic period, products are mass produced and yet they are also customized, tailored to specific global communities. Technology is instantly available and widely shared, and the strategic processes focus on both product and process. 
Bhattacharya, who was the second author in that book, gave a TED talk where he talked about the changes in globalization. And he brought, provided context for what, at the time, was a very negative assessment of global, globalization and the idea that maybe globalization is dead, or if not dead, it's dying. So when he provided that context, he said, what you see before you now is the growth of nationalism, anti-trade measures that are more prevalent than pro-trade initiatives, global trade that was slowing, and trade was no longer a global GDP multiplier, and multilateral agreements were declining. So he spoke about this, but he said to the naysayers, it's not dead, it's just evolving. The operations and strategies now for globalization rely less on physical shipment of goods and more on transmitting global data, less on physical country boundaries, and more on customers' digital access to service and product. We've moved into a period where rules across the world are less standardized, and the geopolitical situation is often volatile, which means that even in places that have bilateral trade agreements, there is still tension. Now, there was a book written years ago called The World is Flat. It wasn't then, it's not now, but the basic idea about that book is that the barriers that used to inhibit trade have been so reduced that it is possible to trade across borders much more easily than before. The new global model recognizes the need for operational structures that can absorb the shocks from rapidly changing environmental environments and can, that can pivot using local talent in locations to respond strategically as new dynamics are introduced. Now meeting the requirements for the globalized world involves an appreciation for culture as a factor in a global business landscape. There's a term called metacultural CQ. It means a high level of consciousness about culture during business engagement. It expresses the idea that managers and executives in all levels of staff really have to be aware of different cultural settings and aware of the impact of their individual actions on those settings. So let's start by taking just a quick look at the components of our global business environment. The diagram on the slide is centered around risks, but risks go hand in hand with opportunity. What are the recurring risks? Financial, foreign taxation, changing currency rates and asset valuation. Commercial, operational problems, timing of planned entry into a market, that's crucial. The level of competition, and poor execution of strategy. Now, poor execution of strategy is often a result of less cultural preparedness. That, that's why that happens. Third one is political, barriers to trade, corruption, lack of safeguards for intellectual property, and social unrest. And so the element that is often missed, and why I added that here, is culture, because it impacts particularly the commercial arena. So. Having discussed the risks, then why do we engage in global business? Well, there are several reasons. To identify new markets is one. And what speaks to identifying and supporting new markets? Foreign direct investment. According to the UN Conference on Trade and Investment in 2023, 9.1 billion in US dollars went to Portugal in 2022. Now that's still below pre-COVID levels, but it's healthy. Those dollars primarily went to the service sector, but there is now increasing interest in renewable energy, which is a focus that the Portuguese government is championing. In fact, the country has committed to carbon neutrality by 2050, They're the first country to do so. They have also adopted a national hydrogen strategy to produce and export green hydrogen with the hydrogen produced by renewable sources such as wind and solar power. So that's a those are new markets. Foreign direct investment is interested in that. Now, Portugal is a small nation, 2.2 million people. I use that, you know, there's a, a clock that gives you in real time what the population is, and as of yesterday, it was 2.2 million people. So that's how many people are there. Population is on a decline, actually, in Portugal, but they are still an innovative nation, and they are working effectively despite the challenges of population and their infrastructure. Investors' confidence in Portugal can be measured by the number of unicorn enterprises. Is that a term with which you are familiar? Unicorn enterprises. There were six identified unicorns 
in the nation in 2023. Now that term was coined by Eileen Lee in 2013, and it refers to private startups with a valuation of $1 billion or more. So in a small country like Portugal, they have six unicorn enterprises. Some of those are SaltPay, which started in 2019. That's a system that provides secure payment solutions for small and medium businesses. Most of Portugal businesses are small and medium, not the large international businesses that we think about that are here in this country. Second is TalkDesk, started in 2011. It's an AI-powered customer service business that reduces cost and improves efficiency of operations. And then there's a third, Sword Health. I don't know where they get the names, but these are kind of cool. Sword Health started in 2015. It's a healthcare company that provides a virtual and digital physical therapy. And I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but I am. So what you, you do is you sign on and you get a real person that talks you through certain things. You do your therapy virtually. And even as you were doing things like walking, you turn on the app and a virtual person is telling you, all right, you need to do this, you need to do that, you've walked too long this way, you've taken too many steps here. It's really cool. It's sort of beyond my normal way of thinking, but it's where business is going. And if you think about it, these businesses I have identified in Portugal all have a common, name, common denominator, and it's high tech. The businesses that are succeeding are those that understand and can use technology effectively. So we engage in global business to identify new markets. We engage to, low, to leverage core competencies there is a business called Five Nine. It operates in the United States and Portugal and several other places, and it's called a leader in conversational AI. It's like customer service ramped up a level. It was started in 2001, and early successes allowed them to partner with other organizations to get financial leverage to expand their core services, including developing a new engineering hub in Porto, acquiring a business in North Carolina called Asius which allows them to do call center, call center metrics in a way that they couldn't do before, and to launch Five Nines Global University for product information and training programs. So you do well, then you can bring in new partners into the mix and use that leverage to continue to grow and to innovate. We also engage in global business to improve competitive solutions. In December 2023, there was an article in uh, Mon Mongabay.com. Now, Mongabay is a nonprofit environmental and conservation news platform. The headline was, a lithium gold mine is buried under one of Europe's last heritage farming systems. The article reported on the Barossa region in northern Portugal that is identified as globally important as a farming system for agriculture, biodiversity, and maintaining resilient ecosystems. Additionally, it has a cultural heritage that is significant to the region, being named by the United Nations as one of only eight globally important agricultural heritage systems. But that region has been identifying, defined as containing large deposits of lithium needed for transition to cleaner energy. And Savannah Resources in the United Kingdom wants to build what may become Western Europe's largest open pit lithium mine in Covas de Barroso. So you see the tension here. It's an opportunity for new business. It improves competitive solutions. The fears of the people who live in the region, soil erosion, contaminated water. Challenges for Savannah resources are the very negative response of the residents who live there who don't want to change what has been a way of life for centuries. So globalization is a push and a pull. You have to manage and negotiate what your priorities are going to be. And that's an example of that. Now, one of the things we also do different in the business department, I teach business communication along with Professor Bearden, and we are accustomed to doing slides that are black and white, a few bullet points, not much on them. So this is, this is my homage to Portugal, I put, found two pictures I could put up there. The top one is Lisbon, the second one is Porto, and I thought those were interesting pictures. And the other reason I included those two pictures is because that's where the majority of the new business is coming, is to Lisbon and to Porto. There was a group called Charting the Economy. You'll see the quotes that I have there. 
that provides information on countries worldwide for an audience of CEOs to share its analysis for doing business in specific countries. The good news, Portugal was deemed an easy place to do business. Starting a business is not cumbersome. Registering is easy, although it's expensive, but it's easy. Trading across borders, they got a 100% rating in terms of the ease of trading across borders. Getting credit is fairly easy. So those are things that CEOs would want to hear if they're thinking about opening shop in Portugal. Reports indicate that continued economic recovery is expected to be strong over the next two years. That third bullet point with that title, that's from an article written by AICEP, which is an independent public entity of the government of Portugal. Their aim is to attract foreign investment and provide support for national companies to become international. Their focus is automotive, IT, biosciences, which includes pharmaceuticals and biotechnology, and the specific focus in the United States is California, Silicon Valley. That's where they're trying to partner to increase their global presence. This is a partial distribution of industries. It does not add up to 100. I didn't put some of the little tiny ones on there, but these are the major industries in Portugal. And as you can see, services is the big one. And that's why the examples that I'm going to give come from the services industry. Just so you'll know, what is it that Portugal exports? Cars. Right. They have plants Toyota, Mitsubishi, Peugeot, and VW Auto Europa, and motor vehicle parts. Their top export countries are Spain first, United States second, France third. What do they import? Mineral fuels electrical equipment, plastics, and pharmaceuticals. And as I was preparing, I was thinking there's a disconnect in some ways between what Portugal says it wants to do and the things that they are importing that are <laughs> directly opposed to some of the clean energy initiatives that they are championing. So I'll have to watch it over the next couple of years and see if it really comes to bear or not. But those are the, those are the major industries. Okay. Now I put this slide in here on purpose before I start doing the um, examples that I want to show you because you need to understand what culture is. And the best definition that I have seen is the culture is the collective programming of the mind by which one group of people distinguishes itself from other groups. So it's not individual behaviors. It's something that is adopted by communities of people. It is so much internalized that we don't think about it. One of, one of the um, lectures that I usually do with my one of my first classes in international business to show them the picture of a small fish bowl with the fish swimming around in it. And one fish says to the other one, how's the water? And the other fish says, what water? That's culture, that it is so internalized that you don't see what it is that incorporates your environment. For you, it just is. So you don't have to think about it. That's also what makes culture so difficult to view from another's perspective, because what we have internalized, we assume is the way to do things. In business, that can be, prob it is problematic. There is not the way. There are multiple ways to do business, but if you can't see beyond your own cultural orientation, then you will be challenged. So we know what culture is, and in cultural intelligence is a combination of intellectual knowledge. You know, I teach this class, partly because it is one of the things that is recommended for all college students nationally. It's recommended that college students have some cultural knowledge because they're going out into a world, into a global environment. So they need to have the skills to navigate that. And so the class on international business is one of the ways it introduces them to that. You need the intellectual knowledge, then you need the actual skills, the competencies, the business competencies to do the job, and then you need mindfulness. You have to think about what you were doing and choose to engage in a way that encourages acceptance across cultural parameters. Let me ask you a few questions. Well, think about how you respond to things. When you're in a situation, do you speak your mind or do you communicate in a more nuanced way, assuming that the person to whom you are speaking will be able to read the air and pick up on a secondary message? That's culture. Western culture, 
we tend to speak our mind. European cultures, Portuguese culture, a little more nuanced in terms of what they do. So you have to listen a little more carefully sometimes to get what the real message is because they're not going to just give it to you as directly as we would do. Do you address colleagues by their first name immediately or wait until you are invited to do so? Portugal is more formal. So you don't come in and say, hey, Bill, how you doing? You wait until that person invites you to use their first name. How do you dress when you're preparing for a meeting? This is a big one. I'm looking at my faculty colleagues here that we wrestle with a lot because students are more casual in a lot of ways these days. And a lot of businesses in this country are indeed casual. But that's not universal. So if you were doing business in Portugal, men, you need to have a suit. Women, you need to dress modestly. These are things that we have to teach that if we don't teach, people won't know. How do you ensure that your disagreements are productive? Okay? Conflict happens in business. But there are different ways in managing disagreements, so you have to think about that. When you, negotiate, when you have completed a negotiation, do you shake hands or do you put it in writing? In Portugal, you're going to put it in writing. Okay? It's not an agreement until it's been signed off on all the parties. These are questions that you ask and things that you need to know before you ever start to do business. Now, the Portuguese assume that they can trust you until you prove otherwise. They are friendly. They are accepting people in terms of business. The expectation is that long-term personal relationships will develop. It's not necessarily a part of Western culture. We do business, and business is separate from other things that we do. It's not the relationship. It's the objective for the business. In Portugal, that's not the case. The hope is that you will develop a long-term personal relationship. You'll see, likely, a small group of negotiators. When you watch the movies, sometimes, you'll see these armies march into a room ready to negotiate, taking up a whole table. If you're in Portugal, that's not going to happen. There'll be a small group of people, sometimes even just one person. And what may appear is something in the middle of the, of the negotiation that wasn't even considered as a part of the first package. Just show up. Roll with it. Okay. When an agreement appears to have been reached, expect the final document to take a lot of time. And that's because Portugal is a hierarchical society. Things come top down. That takes time. There are lots of layers to go through, and they're not going to change the order of what they do because you want something done. Don't push. That's hard for cultures that are more time-driven to work with. Don't push because you, that's, that insults the Portuguese because they've told you what their protocols are. You're in their country, so you need to, you need to learn how to work with the orientation that they have. Let me real quickly talk about two companies that get the picture about the cultural piece. The first is Airbnb. Everybody knows Airbnb and their story, right? Two young guys just starting to, wanting to make some extra money. They bought some air mattresses. They put them in their apartment in San Francisco, and they hosted three people over a weekend. I thought, that's a pretty good idea. I tried to start a business from it. Funders were not interested. It went absolutely nowhere. They even picked a name that they didn't realize had already been used by somebody else. I think it was roommates.com. So they had to go back to the drawing board. And their name initially was not Airbnb. It was airbedandbreakfast.com, spelled out all the way. In 2008, they tried again, doing a Democratic National Convention. And some of you may remember this. One of their strategies was they had cereal boxes, Obama O's, and Captain McLean's. And they sold the cereal. And in the cereal was a marketing pitch for their business. And that's how they started to actually get the attention for their business. So that they started small. But Business Insider wrote a story in 2019 called How Three Guys Turned Renting Air Mattresses in Their Apartment into a $31 billion industry. So look at them now. 5 million hosts, 100,000 locations, 1.5 guests continue to expand and innovate. Now, according to the Portugal Hotel and Chains report, in October 2023, tourism accounts for about 16% of Portugal's GDP. Airbnb is a significant part of that tourism picture. Reports anticipate that tourism growth this year will surpass 2019, which is good because that was, the, that was before the pandemic hit. One final note about Airbnb, maybe under the category of unintended consequences, they have been a real boon to Portugal. 
It's been a tremendous benefit to individual hosts in Lisbon. The top 25 homeowners each listed 60 properties. The aggressive program to encourage tourism with rising prices on rentals has resulted in pricing the local residents out of the rental market. So that's something that will need to be watched as well. The country has been promoting tourism through the National Tourism Authority, labeling the effort close to the US, close to Portugal. One strategy was to feature images of Portugal on a digital billboards in Times Square. And it must be working because America has the third highest number of overnight tourists in Portugal behind Spain and the United Kingdom. Now I have on there the Pesanta hotel change. What I find interesting is that the international change that I usually look for, Marriott hotels and resorts, places like that, are not at the top of the hospitality list for Portugal. National Portuguese operations hold that distinction. That's why I listed Pastana Hotel Group here. It's at the top of most rankings, whether you're talking about number of locations, number of rooms, whether it's budget or luxury, they're on top. And I think Pastana must have got something right because their employees have the opportunity to work for six to nine months in another country to aid their intercultural development. Another feature of culture and tourism, the Pastana Hotel Group includes Pousadas, P-O-U-S-A-D-A-S. -A -A Those are often state-owned historical buildings, convents, monasteries, castles. That adds to the, cost, to the cultural dimension for visitors, that you can stay in places like that instead of in a Marriott. You can stay in a former convent or a castle. That's cultural. Two other things quickly I put in here. Mice tourism. Had any of you heard of mice? That was, that was a new one for me. My stands for meetings, incentives, conferences, and exhibitions. Portugal is in a top 10 for that. It's in a mix with the United States, Spain, and Italy. And it makes sense because particularly Porto and Lisbon are go-to destinations for lots of reasons, including they have top hotels, the top restaurants. The environment is probably a contributing factor since they enjoy, I understand, about 300 days of sunshine annually. And then the other one is birth tourism which is being marketed as a niche market for Portugal. Now, birth tourism is not new. The United States is number, United States and Canada are number one and two. But our countries are not presenting that as something that they want to encourage. Portugal is because they say their healthcare system is excellent. They're looking for the residents. The right of soil applies. That's one of 10, Portugal is one of 10 EU member states where that is applicable which means that when a child is born, the child is automatically a citizen as long as one of the parents has been in country for at least one year, irrespective of legal status. So that's going to be one to watch in terms of business because if you have birth tourism and the family stay, they contribute to the economy immediately. Long term, it means more residents, more workforce. So I can see where that would be a positive for them. Promise to get back to Unbabble. Unbabble, when I was working on this, I don't know where Dean is, I was talking to Dean, and he asked me if it had something to do with the Tower of Babel, and I didn't tell him at the time that he was right. It absolutely does. Um, comes from, you know, Genesis 11, verse 9, where the Lord confused the languages of the whole world. Well, in Unbabel, they're saying we're just the opposite. What we do is we have a platform that we can translate over 300 languages very quickly, and so we remove those language barriers. So if you sign on with us, we can help you do business in any country that you are in without even having to think about it. It is an AI-powered language ops translation platform. That's a mouthful, but basically what I understand it to mean is that you plug in what you need the customer service and your customer service to say, and it will say that in the language that you need. And they have safeguards so that they have both AI interventions and human interventions. And when you purchase the package, you decide if you want just AI or if you want AI plus human, and it's a really neat way to work. They were founded in 2013. Their slogan is automation when possible, human when needed. All right, I'm very quickly going to go through this. I think I'm 30 minutes now. Hofstetter. Hofstetter was the first, first person who saw it and who documented what it's like to have 
different cultural orientations and why it mattered. He examined IBM employees in 54 different countries, all doing the same job. The only distinction was the country in which they operated. These are four of the dimensions that he talked about, uncertainty avoidance, motivation toward achievement, individualism, and power distance. And you can see the orange is the United States and the blue is Portugal. When you are high in uncertainty avoidance, uncertainty is a threat. This matters for business, right? We come in and we're ready to get started and we're gun ho but you don't know clearly the path ahead. If you have this orientation, you're going to be hesitant to move because you were threatened by not being sure. In a high uncertainty avoidance, there's an emotional need for rules. Even if those rules don't work really well, you have to have the rules. Employees tend to stay in place for longer periods of time, and the focus is on the content of decisions as opposed to the process. Now, the rules in this kind of culture with strong uncertainty avoidance mean that there is less entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is innovation within a corporate setting. But as a result, there is lots of entrepreneurship because people will leave corporate settings so that they are less constrained and they can do business the way they need to do business. Okay. We are a, we, the United States, is a weak uncertainty avoidance culture, which means uncertainty is a part of life. You just deal with it. Okay. Employees have shorter periods of service because we teach you do well, you get promoted, you move. So that long-term orientation is not necessary. Motivation toward achievement in Portugal, the buzzwords are consensus, solidarity, and quality of life. In the United States, an expectation that monetary and professional success will follow achievement. And it's more of a live to work. That's kind of a cliche, but more a live to work, whereas in Portugal, it's a work to live. And it's the idea that their culture is that they have a better balance. They want to work, and they do their work really well. They're committed to the work, but they are also committed to family. And so they have a different level of um, balance work life than we do in our culture. Individualism, Portugal is self-reliant. They expect that decisions are evidence-based. We do that here. The difference here is that for us, individual means that you can skip the official lines. So I work for the vice president, but if I wanted to talk to the president, I can do that. And nobody is going to, <laughs> you, see, you see him? Did you see what he did back there? He just crossed his arms. I can do that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because, because it's a part of, the, part of the culture. It's expected that you can cross those lines. It's also expected that you'll get a voice in what happens. That's how we view individualism. So when decisions are made, we want to be considered in those decisions. So that's what that represents. And then the last is power distance. In Portugal, the boss is the boss. In terms of business, that means if you are working with people in Portugal and you expect feedback from folks who report to you, it's less likely to happen. Because the expectation is your boss gives you the orders and you do what that boss says, okay? I love this slide because it represents for a lot of countries in the world different cultural orientations. And I put that up there, I highlighted Portugal so that you can see that Portugal is high on a multi-active list. Now, it's the communication tool only. It's what it refers to. What it says is that if you're in Portugal, you may work with unpredictable timetables, don't expect quite the punctuality that we do here. They interweave the social and the professional, and the planning is at the grand level. For those of us who are detail-oriented and we plan step by step by step, that's not in general the way the Portuguese plan. It is at a grander level. And arguments, the other reason this one matters, think about it, business is sitting around at a table, they're negotiating, they're arguing. If you are in that setting, the arguments of people from Portugal and other cultures like that become loud and emotional, doesn't mean angry, just loud. So I, when I do a, a simulation with my students where I have them try and pretend that they are, some are from Portugal, some are from Japan, some are from another country, so that they get accustomed to how do you respond if somebody's up and they're using their hands a lot and they're getting really loud. They're not mad, they're just more emotive. Okay. You have to think about how to deal with that when you are working across cultural lines. And that's one of the big ones for Portugal is they are multi-active, not linear active, okay? So let me, let me end here. This is, this is a quote from the International Trade Administration. 
Portugal was an excellent entry point for U.S. firms seeking to establish EU connections. It is, and my belief is that if companies are going to maximize their ability to thrive in Portugal, they have to have a management approach that is responsive to cultural expectations, a geocentric management approach that uses local and corporate personnel. It's, it's kind of the think globally, operate locally paradigm. Globalization is a process. It's not a destination. I think that is really important. It incorporates economics, technology, national security, the physical environment, and all those attributes are impacted by culture. You can't look at business, global business, without understanding culture. We read about the success stories. There are lots of them in Portugal. You can read about some less successful stories, and part of the reason for their failures is not just dollars and cents. It's understanding the environment in which they need to operate. What it takes to get there in terms of globalization is an understanding of business principles and a clear, not just understanding, but a willingness to put yourself in the perspective of the other so that you can communicate in culturally appropriate ways to advance the business that you represent. Thank you. <laughs>